God wrote a book in which a man was taken to see the next life and then came back to write to us and say, this is the meaning of this one. The purpose of life is right here. So here's what Paul is saying here. He says, It's my eager expectation and my certainty that I will not be at all found to have trusted in a Savior that was false or trusted in a Messiah or a Deliverer that turned out to be untrue. I won't be shown that. I, won't be, I will not be put at all to, sh- to shame, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body. And that is why Paul is rejoicing. That's why he has such joy. Because he's going to, as he's going to say in just a moment, Christ is everything to him. And so when Christ is honored, he has joy. Remember how he started the whole letter. I'm the slave of Christ. And as Christ is exalted, so am I exalted. So now, with full courage, as now as always with Christ, who will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. And then here comes the verse that we've been waiting for. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So we see the connections here. Paul says, by life or by death. And then we see the connection from that to live and die. And that same connection is going to continue on through the rest of the paragraph there, where Paul says that there is a choice to live, and that will mean fruitful labor. But then there's also this dying, in which I will go and be with the Lord. I would rather do that but I know that I will do the other because it's for your benefit. So we see all the connections between live and die, life and death there. So he says, whether by life or by death, Christ will be honored. Verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is, I believe, the theme of the whole letter. And so we'll make a few comments and some observations about this, but we might say, well, why don't we talk about this verse more? Actually, we're going to talk about this verse for the rest of the letter. Because what Paul says here, this is the lens through which we're going to see everything else that he says. And so we're actually going to talk about living as Christ and dying as gain through the next four chapters. Because this is the theme of what Paul has to say to the Philippians. Everything up to this point has just been kind of getting the train going. So let's think about what he says here. He says, for to me, to live as Christ and to die as gain. So if we were reading this in the original language, we would see that Paul emphasizes there the word me. He takes me and he takes it out of the regular word order so that a native Greek reader that would jump off the page, it's like Paul was underlining me. He's bringing attention to me. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So I think what that means is the two things at least. I think first of all, Paul's drawing a distinction between himself and the preachers that he just talked about, those who are preaching the true gospel, but they are doing it from hypocritical motives. Remember we said last week that they're preaching this gospel and their motives for doing it betray the very gospel they preach. So they're preaching about redemption in Christ Jesus and the sufficiency of Christ and all that, but they're doing it from a heart that wants to use those words to hurt Paul. And so Paul is drawing a distinction between him and them. Because to Paul, Christ is everything. Christ is is his life. And so if Christ is his life, then he's not going to have those hurtful motives that these others said. So he's making a distinction between him and them. And so, like we said last week, the most important thing to Paul was that the gospel was being preached. But at the same time, Paul also recognizes that there's some wrong motives going on there, that they are trying to hurt him after all. So he's making a distinction there. The second thing that I think is helpful to see here, when Paul says, to me, to live as Christ and to die as gain, I think that we must pause there and ask ourselves the question, who is it that's saying these words? Because what Paul goes on to say is essentially the meaning of life. It's the purpose of life. Now, a lot of people have an idea about what the purpose of life is, the meaning of life. 
And who that person is changes how much credence we might give to their idea of the meaning or the purpose of life. So what does it mean that this man Paul is saying, here's the the meaning of life? Well, let's think about Paul. Not only was he an apostle of God, not only was he chosen by God, handpicked by God to be the one who received more revelations about the character and the person of God, about the gospel than any other biblical writer. Not only was he the one appointed to go to the Gentiles, he was the one who obviously met Jesus Christ face to face, the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. Remember all this? He also suffered incredibly for the cause of the gospel. He, this is his fourth imprisonment, and he's now been in prison for at least four years. Not to mention all the beatings he has endured, all of the, the, the stonings, the shipwrecks, all of the hardship that Paul has endured. All of that would go a long way to helping us to give credence to what this man says is the meaning or the purpose of life. But there's one other thing that I think stands head and shoulders above all of that. And this all begins in Acts chapter 14. In Acts chapter 14, Paul is traveling on a missionary journey with this fellow by the name of Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas go to this place called Lystra. And they show up here at Lystra and they want to begin preaching the gospel. There's a little bit of a language barrier. And so Paul begins preaching the gospel and the people, the, the uh, Lystrans or Lystronians, whatever they may be called, the people that live in Lystra, the inhabitants, they're not quite understanding what Paul and Barnabas are saying. They, they misunderstand this gospel that they're presenting. Now, in the course of doing this, there's a fellow there who's got some, something wrong with a leg. He's got a crippled leg or something of that nature or, or an injured leg. And Paul heals it, or Jesus heals it through Paul, rather. And when that happens, these Lystrans see this and still not quite understanding what Paul is saying, they begin to think that Paul and Barnabas are gods. And they begin to worship Paul and Barnabas. And they're even bringing out a bull and they're going to sacrifice it to Paul and Barnabas. And remember, there's this language barrier. So Paul and Barnabas, they, they start to figure out what's, what's happening here. And then they say, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. You got this all wrong. And Paul says that, or Luke says that they barely stop them before they make this sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas. Well, something else that's going on is there's this group of Jews that really don't like Paul. And they follow Paul everywhere he goes. And wherever Paul goes, they, they show up and they begin undermining what Paul is preaching. Well, about this time, the Jews show up and start doing what they normally do. And they see the situation, they see how what's going on here, and they stir up these, this crowd against Paul and Barnabas. In Acts 14, they, they convince the crowd, the Lystrans there, to stone Paul. And that's exactly what happens. Verse 19, the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went on to, with Barnabas to Derby. So if they thought Paul was something when he healed the guy's leg, I bet they really thought he was something when he walked back into the town. Luke says they supposed that he was dead. I'm going to suggest to you he was. That they, they stoned him to death. The disciples gathered around him and then he just, he was brought back to life. He gets back up and goes back in. So Paul experienced death, but that's not the only thing he experienced. If we turn over to Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter, uh, I think, uh, 12. Yeah, 12. Paul is discussing some issues with the Corinthian church here and the fact that there's some false teachers that have come into the church there. And these false teachers are parading themselves about as being more qualified than Paul. And Paul is sort of having a little fun with this, saying... Who between us is really more qualified here? And so he goes through his qualifications. And then he, in, he ends all that by saying this, And I know a man, he's speaking about himself, you know, I know a man who was caught up into paradise. So if we put those two together, what happens was Paul was stoned 
to death. And he visited heaven. He saw the other side. He was taken to see what awaits us. Now, there's sort of a fad over the past, I don't know, decade or so. Every once in a while, every few years, there's a book that comes out about somebody who supposedly has gone and seen heaven and come back to write about it. Okay, I've read those books. They're garbage. They, they are so easily refuted. Don't, don't fall for that. That's, that's an, an, a sham. Paul really was taken to see what awaits us. And now he comes back and he writes to us, this is the meaning of this life. Now, brothers and sisters, if someone who's seen the next life says to me, this is the purpose of that one, I think we should be all ears for that. As believers, we have the man whom God used to write two-thirds of the New Testament, who He took and showed him the other side and sent him back to continue teaching us. And He tells us what is the purpose of life, and to our shame, we listen to Hollywood actors when they want to tell us the purpose of life or we want to listen to some professional athlete tell us what the purpose of life is or we want to read some popular book that tells us what the purpose of life is. I googled, that's not normally how I do sermon prep, but I googled scripture meaning of life. I guess hoping that I would basically find one result. And it's all over the board. Barna did a survey some, this was about 10 years ago, Barna did a survey in which 62% of professing born-again Christians said that they still had not found their purpose in life. What is going on with those 62%? What's going on with us? God wrote a book in which a man was taken to see the next life and then came back to write to us and say, This is the meaning of this one. And I still hear Christians reading horoscopes. What's wrong with us? The purpose of life is right here. To live is Christ. To die is gain. Now, if we were reading this in the original language, we would see that there's no verbs there. Anybody have a King James? If you're reading the King James, is your King James one of the italicized King James where about one out of every five words is in italics? Okay, a lot of, a lot of the, it is? Okay, so the, the two is's, are they italicized? Yep. What that mean, you know what that means? When you see the italicized words in the King James? Anybody know what that means? That means that those words are supplied by the translators. It means that those words are not in the original. And this happens all the time. When, when scriptures are translated from Greek and Hebrew into English, then a lot of times there's just not a word there in the original that the English sort of needs in order for it to make sense. And translators do this all the time. They supply a word in order for it to make sense in English. And so in this case, there is no verb there that Paul, that Paul says the, the translators have supplied is, which is, which is the right thing to do. But literally what Paul says is, to live Christ, to die gain. It's as simple as that. To live Christ. Everything about living, what life is supposed to be, the purpose of our life, everything is encapsulated in Christ. In knowing Him, in belonging to Him, in following Him, in fellowshipping with Him, everything about life is encapsulated in Jesus Christ. So, what Paul means to, when he says to live is Christ and to die is gain, he's going to explain that for the rest of the letter. The rest of the letter is going to be fleshing out what it means to live Christ, to die, gain. But just to sort of get us started down that road, 
the very least that Paul means is he lives for Christ. I think he means a lot more than that, but at the very minimum, what he means is, I live for Christ. Now, what does it mean to live for Christ? What does it mean to live for anything? As Christians, most of us, I think, in the room probably have been within a church context most of our life. And so, when we're asked the question, what do you live for? Then, here's what happens, is we know what the answer is supposed to be. And we feel an extreme discomfort with answering that question, what do you live for, with anything other than what we know the answer is supposed to be. The answer is supposed to be Jesus, right? And so we're really, really not comfortable saying anything other than Jesus because we know that's dead wrong. So the question, what do you live for, it's worth asking, and it's worth asking in a way that helps us to sort of get around that knee-jerk reaction that says, well, I know the answer is Jesus. Jesus has got to be in there somewhere because if Jesus is not part of that answer, then, then something's really wrong with me. So let's think of it this way because I like to ask questions that force you to be honest with yourself because I think that far too often we're not honest with each other and far too often we're not honest with ourselves. We get really comfortable wearing the Christian mask and sometimes that mask has been on for so long that we don't even, we're not even sure what we look like underneath it. And so sometimes we have to ask some uncomfortable, difficult questions that will force us to be honest with ourselves. And so here's the way I think we should ask that question. When we ask ourselves the question, what do you live for? Then what is it in your life that if you lost it, you don't think that you could ever be happy again? What is it in your life, and it may be more than one thing, what is it that if you lost it today, you have serious doubts that you could ever really be happy again. It may be a person. It may be a spouse. It may be a child. It may be a parent. It may be a status, a position. It may be something you've attained, something you've worked for a long time. It may be a possession. It may be a house that you wanted for a long, long time. It may be health. It may be your freedom to move about and do what you want. And so you think that maybe getting older and losing some of the freedom to go and do what I want, I'm not sure that I could ever really be happy if that happened. Whatever it is, that is what you live for. And for most of us, it's more than one thing. And if we belong to Jesus, probably the answer is Jesus and some other things too. If we're really, really honest with ourselves, the thing or the person or the status or the accomplishment or the possession or the health that we in our hearts, we really think if I lost that, I'm not sure I could ever really be happy. That is what you live for. And that is your God. Now, let's do this exercise. Paul says, for me, I live for Christ. To live is Christ. Then he goes on to say, because I live for Christ, to die is gain. So if you take that first word, Christ, and let's just sort of do this exercise together. Change that word to anything else. And what has to happen to the second part of that phrase? If you change Christ to anything else, to die is loss. In fact, if that first blank is Christ plus anything, If you live for Christ, but you also live for something else, then it's still loss. The only way that dying is gain is when all that you live for is Christ. When He is your only God. 
not the same thing that is saying he's the only thing we care for and we don't love our family and loved ones and we don't work hard at our jobs and all these other things, but that is to say the only way that dying is gain is if Jesus Christ is the only thing that fits that description when you say that's the only thing that I could lose and never be happy. If your life is being lived for anything other than Jesus and Jesus alone, then death will be loss for you. And folks, there is nothing more certain for all of us than death unless we see Jesus return. All of us will experience that, some of us sooner than others. And I'm not, I'm not referring to anybody's age because I think among, among this group, I think I've heard at least three stories of, of very young people who lost their life tragically very early. It has nothing to do with age. All of us will face that, some of us sooner than later. And unless Jesus Christ is the only thing that you can truly say, that's the only thing I can't give up and still be happy. Then when that day comes, death will be loss. But what a glorious thing that Paul can say to us. Because Christ is what He lives for. This thing that is coming that is more certain than anything for Him means complete gain. How is it gain? Well, the one He lives for, He will be with Him. He will no longer fellowship with Christ by faith. He will fellowship with Christ by sight. And the one that He lives for, the one that He continues to hurt in His life by the sin that remains, remember the end of Romans chapter 7, when Paul says, all these things that I know I shouldn't do, I I, I can't stop, I still keep on doing them. All the things, the sinful, fallen ways that Paul still has that he knows hurts the one he lives for will end. And he will never again hurt or disappoint or frustrate the one that he lives for. That will be complete gain for Paul. The Scriptures encourage us to think well about your own death. It's not something that we like to think about. I remember being much younger and never being a serious topic that crossed my mind. You sort of think about it every once in a while. And then as the older we get, it sort of becomes a thing we think about more and more. But the Scriptures encourage us, people who are followers of Jesus of all ages to think well about how you will die. And when you do, what will it be for you? Will it be loss or will it be gain? The rest of the letter Paul is going to teach us how it is that for him it's total gain. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Truth That Transforms with pastor and Bible teacher Jason Wilkerson. Truth That Transforms is the daily teaching broadcast of Disciples Fellowship Church. We invite you to visit our website where you will find more resources to help in your journey of discipleship. You can find us at www.disciplesfellowshipnc.com or connect with our Facebook page at facebook slash disciplesfellowshipnc. Truth That Transforms exists to glorify Jesus Christ through the teaching of His sanctifying and disciple-making Word.